They say, uh, keep your, your friends close, but your enemies closer. Well, pollutants are kind of the enemy of humans, and uh, we kind of need to keep them close, keep a sharp eye on them. That enemy comes in lots of different forms. Um, sometimes the enemy is fleeting and quick like ninjas, um, but sometimes the enemy can be a little bit more uh, long-lasting, something that uh, just doesn't seem to go away. Uh, that distinction between the two, uh, the ones that pop in, do a lot of damage, and then pop right back out, or the ones that over time can uh, build up the, the kind of danger that's associated with them, uh, that's the difference between a persistent, uh, a persistent pollutant and a non-persistent pollutant. A non-persistent pollutant is one that uh, comes and goes. It comes and goes because it breaks apart really quickly. Um, either the environment, like the organisms there, can take it up and break it down, or um, just it naturally doesn't, uh, it's not a, a, a stable molecule. Um, however, there are some molecules that are way more difficult uh, to, to deal with. Um, no natural process takes care of them, like some pesticides, and we talked about like DDT taking years to break down. Um, that is a persistent pollutant. It's one that like if it gets inside an organism, it's staying there for a long time. And uh, there, there's other types of persistent uh, pollutants, something like mercury, any heavy metal, uh, mercury, lead, cadmium, copper, etc. They're, uh, they're dangerous uh, in that they can't be broken down, your body doesn't know what to do with them, and they end up building up in a system, um, and they're not a system, uh, your system isn't one that you want them building up in. So uh, persistent chemicals versus non-persistent chemicals, ones that break down quickly and ones that tend to stick around. So because uh, there's, there's different types of chemicals um, and uh, they come and go, they do damage, or they take a while to build up damage, uh, we, we tend to watch really key ecosystems, uh, like any important river or any lake, uh, we, a forest for, for example, uh, we can carefully watch them to make sure that they are healthy. So how do we watch them? There's there's kind of two different types of indicators that we that we use to look at an environment and say like, hey, are you healthy or are you about to enter a crisis or are you in the middle of a crisis? Um, that uh, uh, that is our chemical indicators and biological indicators. Let's start with biological indicators. So there's tons of different types of bioindicators. A biological indicator is when you look at the, the living things in an ecosystem to, to see if the, the organisms there are okay or if the environment is potentially about to collapse. Um, so bioindicators uh, that can come in the form of plants or algae or um, like different insects or even larger animals um, can help us uh, tell how healthy an ecosystem is. Uh, how healthy an ecosystem is. Frogs are a great example of something that like when water quality starts to go down, um, frogs seem to be one of the first organisms to disappear. If you, if you notice a frog population gone or absent from a, a certain area of a river or a pond um, or the entire pond altogether, that's a pretty good indicator that that is unhealthy. Um, one of our best indicators um, in water sources would be something like um, the, the types of larvae that grow there. Um, in a, a healthy ecosystem, you tend to see the, uh, the, the hierarchy of fish. You see like the smaller fish that um, are eaten by the bigger ones, which are eaten by even bigger ones like perch and bass. Um, but and, and you see some of the uh, certain types of fly larvae in there, like stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies. Um, as, as something happens, like say there's an overwhelming amount of decomposition or just the overall water quality is going down, um, you start seeing more and more dragonfly nymphs or damselflies, craneflies. Um, you also start seeing uh, like the type of fish that you're seeing. Um, you seem to lose that hierarchy of fish and you're looking more towards only the, the type of fish that are like cleaners, like catfish, um, or um, any bottom feeder off of the bottom of a lake. Um, those, those types of fish uh, that, that are um, basically working around decomposing stuff, uh, that's, that's what you tend to find. Um, and then when you get into an even more 
um, series uh, situation where more and more of the life is gone, potentially like the water quality is <laughs> absolute crap. Uh, you start seeing things like midge and uh, black flies, leeches, uh, the total absence of fish. Uh, there's some pretty good uh, indicators that like if that's all you're seeing in your water, um, you've got uh, an unhealthy situation. So you, th those are called bioindicators. You, you can look at, again, like the fish, the, the macroinvertebrates, which are like your, uh, remember invertebrate means something without a spine. So you're looking at insects and worms and stuff. Um, and frogs, algae, there's tons of different living things you can look at. But some of them are a little bit better than others at telling you um, how well the ecosystem. So then there's chemical indicators as well. Um, that's by doing some sort of chemical assay, um, you can uh, examine what, what chemicals are in an environment. Uh, different chemicals are pretty good indicators that something wrong is happening, that an area is being polluted. For example, too much mercury or any heavy metal. Um, looking at pesticides, um, we, are, we already talked about how fertilizers can be pretty catastrophic to water ecosystems. So if you test the water for how much phosphorus and how much nitrogen's in there or potassium, looking for the potential input of fertilizer from nearby farmlands, um, you can see if there's some spike in the, uh, in the types of chemicals in water or soil. And from there you can make predictions on how the environment might change or uh, if the environment's going to be affected or damaged in some sort of way. Um, those are chemical indicators. The air is an important part of the, the whole system of ecosystems. Uh, like, the, like just looking at us, how we're affected, like we breathe air. We need it. We breathe it in. We want the oxygen. But when we breathe in, we also take in the other potential crap that's in the air. So uh, we're, we need to take care of our air and then like the air is also deeply connected with the other systems like water systems and acid rain. Um, we we want to know what's up in our air and in what concentrations um, and uh, from there again we can make predictions on whether the, the environment is going to be affected or not. So some of the chemicals that we're concerned with, uh, particularly ones uh, that are either directly hazardous to our health or ones that contribute to some sort of environmental damage. Um, let's start with um, the environmental damage. Let's talk acid rain. Um, most of the culprits for this <laughs> come from burning fossil fuels. Um, so those are like sulfur dioxide, um, nitrous oxide, um, and carbon dioxide. Those three are the some of the bigger contributors to acid rain. Uh, when those gases dissolve inside of rainwater, um, they chemically react in there to form acids like sulfuric acid, nitric acid, carbonic acid. Those are the three that come from from those three gases that we put up. Uh, all three of those come from burning fossil fuels. Sulfur dioxide, that's a, a something that's directly um, taken out of from the chemical reaction of fossil fuel combustion. Um, once an engine heats up enough, uh, generally over a thousand degrees Celsius, um, that's where uh, you can end up with nitrous oxide being formed. Um, nitrous oxide, bad, <laughs> forms nitric acid. Um, so like the air surrounding the engine can get, uh, can start chemically reacting where the engine gets really hot producing those chemicals. Uh, it's not actually coming right out of your exhaust, but dangerous nonetheless. Um, and then finally, uh, carbon dioxide. That is the most abundant gas that we put out um, from burning fossil fuels. That is one of the direct products um, from hydrocarbon combustion is carbon dioxide. And remember, the other one is water. So uh, those three things, they go up, they can contribute to acid rain. Now, on top of that, when we're burning our engines, other things happen. We also, um, from the heat of the engine, we can cause oxygen to chemically react to form ozone. Now, we've already talked about how ozone is important. It protects us in the upper atmosphere from, uh, from UV radiation, but that's just it. It needs to be in the upper atmosphere, not at the ground level 
ground level ozone is dangerous, it's hazardous, uh, it causes lung problems. So we don't want to breathe that in and um, our hot machines produce ozone. Also concerning to our air is uh, the amount of greenhouse gases that we're putting up. Uh, this is a topic that comes up over and over again whenever you're talking about anything environmental because it's a real serious concern. Um, changing the temperature of the earth a couple degrees um, is it's just all over the board. All over the board there's bad problems. Um, weather, ecosystem collapse, um, hazards to human health, um, and just uh, mass extinctions. Greenhouse gases uh, are entirely linked to the temperature of the earth. If we knowingly are putting up more greenhouse gases than any natural process we can measure, it's, it's not even debatable. It's not even a discussion that needs to be happening. Um, sadly, that discussion is happening still um, in several smaller sections of the earth. Um, there are people that are still pushing back against the idea of climate change, calling it a big, huge myth. I'm definitely glad to say that uh, the, all of the developed countries in the world, there is no leading government anywhere that thinks climate change is a non-real issue. Um, they all support the, the scientific evidence, and I'm super glad they do. Um, it's mostly just private corporations that, that say otherwise. Um, the, the tough part, though, is how do we deal with that issue? Uh, there's, uh, man, fossil fuels so much all over the planet. Um, every single country contributes to fossil fuel emission, and uh, stopping any of them is a, a massive challenge. Um, it's really cool that lots of countries have taken that on. There are already several smaller countries that are already completely green. They are 100% uh, emission free. Um, the only developed country that has made some serious progress so far is Germany. Um, they have made some pretty big steps to uh, reducing their emissions and uh, they, they've had some great success. Uh, they're predicted to be nearly on target for uh, hitting their, their mark, a, a decade-long uh, goal of dropping their greenhouse gas emissions by 50 percent. They're doing it and they're doing great. Even if they don't hit that mark of getting to 50 percent, um, even if they get to like 35 or 40 percent, if that's if that's their measly goal that they that they managed to accomplish, um, that's still a significant standard for every other country on the planet to shoot for. Um, proving that it doesn't need to be, like fossil fuels are not a, an absolute in, in, in a country. It's not something that has to be there. It can be removed. And that's, that's cool to, to know that somebody's proving that possible. Um, several countries already have, but they're smaller, so it's easy to argue that, oh, a small country can do it, but what about a big country? Um, and, and Germany is taking those steps. It's pretty cool. Um, definitely look them up if you're, if you're still interested in uh, the kind of things that they're, they're accomplishing. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, let's switch gears here and start chatting about monitoring water. Uh, there's a couple key chemicals that we look at inside of water to, to determine the overall health of the ecosystem. The biggest one is oxygen. Usually, if there's really low oxygen, that means there's going to be really low amount of life in that, in that ecosystem. And no wonder most organisms rely on oxygen on this planet. Um, not all, but most. So if you take the oxygen out of the picture, you take the organisms out of the picture almost entirely. So um, how does it get to that kind of a situation? A uh, couple of different ways. One, if there's really low nutrition in the, the, system, the water system to begin with, uh, you're not going to have the algae that are the main contributor of oxygen into, into the system. In the other way, if it's a very, very active system, if there is a large amount of death all at once in the system, 
if you, uh, like a large amount of death and will be accompanied by a large amount of decomposition. Uh, what does that decomposing? Uh, decomposing? Bacteria. Uh, bacteria, they suck up the oxygen. While they're decomposing, they use the oxygen just like us. They, they use it for, for their systems. And if they're taking up the oxygen, we know that there's a lot of decomposition happening. So just by testing the water for oxygen content, we can have a look and see if there's a significant amount of death in an ecosystem. Uh, another chemical indicator that helps us tell the healthiness of an ecosystem is the amount of phosphorus. And uh, that's also tied to the oxygen because phosphorus is the, the main thing that algae need to grow. With no, uh, no phosphorus, you're going to have a really low number of algae. Or, equivalently, there's the chance that the algae have eaten up all the phosphorus and you end up with this huge bloom of algae. Uh, but you'd be able to see that um, with your naked eye. If you have an algae bloom, you know you have an algae bloom. Um, the, the water is the color of the algae. So, uh, phosphorus. Uh, one of the other chemical indicators to tell us how healthy a water system is. Soil is the, the next one that we need to chat about because soil is the, the main substrate for all trees, grass, um, most organism, most uh, producers, uh, aside from water-based ones, are concerned with, with soil. Um, so we can monitor the healthiness of, a, of soil by looking for certain chemicals in there. Um, pesticides and heavy metals are the two that we're going to chat about um, in regards to the monitoring soils. Um, pesticides uh, can build up inside of soils and as we've mentioned before, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, uh, pesticides, they can end up biomagnifying inside of a um, food chain, uh, leaving your, your top predators exposed to high concentrations of chemicals. Um, that can, uh, again, since the, the top predator is such an important part of any ecosystem, they're involved in almost every step along the way, not just in controlling the, the prey that they eat, um, but they, they have a cascading effect all the way down. Most heavy metals uh, are found attached inside of fossil fuels, again, um, and when you, when you burn them, those, uh, those gases can carry the, the heavy metals up with them. Uh, when those gases eventually settle back down, uh, they can settle those uh, heavy metals down with them. Uh, monitoring soil for uh, pollution means also looking for uh, the amount of heavy metals in them. If there's uh, a nearby factory affecting some farmland, uh, we can see that by looking for how much of any heavy metal is inside of soil. Let's finish up. We'll summarize. Um, so chemicals, some of them are persistent, some of them are non-persistent. Uh, that all depends on how long they stick around. Um, sometimes they come and go really quickly, um, other times they're, they're there for a long time. Uh, things that don't break down really quick, like pesticides and heavy metals. Um, and then uh, how we can tell an ecosystem is healthy or not is by looking at uh, different types of indicators. There's biological indicators, um, so looking at the, the living things in an ecosystem to see um, like which types of organisms are there. Um, that can help tell us if, the, if it's healthy or not. Uh, chemical indicators are looking at what types of chemicals exist. In, in an area. Those chemicals uh, are sometimes very indicative of the health of the ecosystem. Uh, we talked about uh, three different areas that we like to monitor. Um, we can monitor the air, water, and soil. When we're looking at the air, we're looking for things like greenhouse gases, um, contributors to acid rain, um, and uh, contributors to smog. Uh, things like ozone and uh, we can also look at our water um, looking for biological indicators and chemical indicators inside of our water um, like the types of uh, larvae that are in there 
are a pretty good indicator of the, the healthiness of the ecosystem. And then uh, we also look very carefully at something like dissolved oxygen inside of water. That's a, that's a huge one for the healthiness of the system. It tells us a lot as oxygen goes up or down. And finally, the soil. Um, soil is where we <laughs> grow most of our plants, uh, and particularly the ones that we eat from. So we need to have techniques for making sure that soil where in which plants are growing uh, is healthy and not at any huge risk. So um, that's all for today. Environmental monitoring. You're an expert now, right? <laughs> Till next time. See ya.